This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas and educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brem. Today we explore the global education architecture and its failures to ensure quality education. My guest is Giran Bahari. In a new article in the International Journal of Educational Development, he calls on the international community to focus on foundational literacy and numeracy, and says it's high time for the global education community to hold itself accountable. The coach for me was important because it reintroduced an element of, element of enchantment in education and literacy. He doesn't talk about it in the point of view of mobility, all these different things. He reminds us literacy has kind of superpowers going across time, across space, and telepathy because you can go in somebody else's mind. So it's kind of like a, a wonderful way for me to re-express the joy that education brings beyond like, you know, like, a, I'm going to get a better job and uh, I will have, you know, I'm going to grow the economy, blah, blah, blah. I think we've lost the, the magic of literacy uh, and what it does. Obviously, there's some scholarship around that as well that I think we don't refer to. I mean, the Galileo Code is like just one of the of examples, but you know, in the like 50s, 60s. Giran Bahari is a senior advisor on global education at the Gates Foundation. He advises on the foundation's efforts to support partners that focus on improving foundational literacy and numeracy in sub-Saharan Africa and India, having initiated and led the program for four years. One note before we start, Garen uses a breathing device which interrupts his speech. We've edited out the pauses as best we can, but there's still points that sound a bit choppy. Garen Bahari, welcome to Fresh Ed. Hi, Will, and thanks for having me. So you have worked in development for some time, um, and there has been quite a lot of focus in development and education for years, decades most likely, that has focused on you know, improving the quality of basic education for all children. So in your assessment, Giran, where are we in terms of improving quality basic education today? Um, well, if you think of the first step as being getting kids in school, on that front, certainly we have made great progress. If you look at the number of kids out of school today, Compared to just 20 years ago, we have about 60 million kids out of school right now, compared to 100 million about 20 years ago. And that's in the context of many more kids going to school. So that's phenomenal. We have more kids in school than ever in the history of humanity. Hmm. And the issue here is that the kids who are going to school, for a large part, are not learning anything. So if you look at the cohort of kids who are in school, about 730 million of them, or 390 million are supposed suppose not to achieve any kind of level of competency. By the end of primary schooling, of which about two thirds, we have completed primary schooling. So we have this very strange situation where most kids who are not learning today are in school, not out of school, by a factor of four or five. So it's, it's kind of like very puzzling to have solved the problem in one way, but not solve the quality problem sufficiently to actually have the promise of schooling turn into education. So that's a really strange phenomenon where we have reached access to such a large extent, but what you're saying is the sort of what children are learning in school is is very few children are actually learning in school. How reliable are some of these metrics that we're using to even begin to understand, you know, the quality of education? How can we be certain that students aren't learning something? Because um, that has to be somehow measurable and comparable across so many countries. Yep, correct. So, I mean... As part of the so-called SDG work, the collective of people decided upon a few metrics that they would measure and track over time. Mm. In the case of early grade literacy, which I'm talking about mostly, there are two key metrics, what they call SDG 4.1.1a and b, which measure the levels of learning uh, of what they call actually minimum proficiency levels, end of grades two and three, or at the end of primary schooling. So countries are meant to report back against this metric. The issue is that countries often don't measure those things, or measure them inconsistently over time. So what is reported back to the UIS, which is the custodian agency, hmm. for SDG4 data is a patchwork of data and information that's really hard to piece together. And even, even UIS has developed a bunch of algorithms to decide you know, which of those uh, indicators is reliable, is consistent across time, can be actually used for reporting purposes. The result today is that if you look at the UIS website and you look at those indicators, especially for Africa, but not only for Africa. It's just empty. Um, you have data points that maybe 10 years old, data points that have come up, you know, from time to time, you know, uh, sporadically for a few countries. But by and large, it's like Swiss cheese with more holes than cheese. And 
so it is very difficult to have a sense today of where we are. Mm. This said, you know, the I think the battery of, of tests that has been done, whether it's what they call EGRA, EGMA, which is USAID has been leading, PASEC tests, which are done pretty rigorously now, as well as what they call the, the um, community-led assessments, both from the PAL network, pretty consistently show you a very, very poor levels of learning across uh, those countries. In early grades, again, I'm looking at the data of SDG on UIS website. If I believe them, in Ghana today, 5% of kids meet minimum proficiency levels by the end of grades 2, 3. So that's kind of, the kind of, uh, of I think, uh, I'm not sure to fully believe that because I've not interrogated the source of this information, but like, uh, it's pretty consistent with what you get from other sources as well. So I guess, you know, in general, we, you know, we sort of have an idea. We probably need more data to get a better sense of what's going on, but we can, you know, get a sense that uh, literacy or many children are not literate when they're in schooling. So, and you end up calling for this idea of functional literacy and numeracy. Could you just define what that that means? Um, yeah, foundational literacy and numeracy. Oh, uh, foundational, sorry. Yeah, uh, again, I'm using, uh, I mean, it's just a way to say the same thing, SDG 4.1.1a and, and b, which are basically minimum proficiency levels for early grade reading and mathematics. You know, you can also encompass in that the end of primary schooling as another metric. So it kind of truly is a compendium of those both those metrics that I call bro- broadly foundational literacy and numeracy. It's quite amazing to think that on those metrics, so many children are failing. So many school systems are failing children based on those metrics. And yet in the 1960s, that was the year of development and or the decade of development, I should say. And one of the big focuses was on universal literacy. So how did we get here? How do we, from the 1960s until today, are we, you know, we keep talking about literacy, but we're not able to actually achieve it on a global scale? That's a good question. (laughs) Uh, In my paper, I do a quick review of, uh, not to the 60s, but the last three decades or so of declarations about literacy and the promises that we need to tackle this fundamental problem and yet continue to face it. I think one reason is it's really hard, especially in a population growth environment, where you're playing catch up. You have many more kids now going into school and therefore you have had to hire many more teachers. Train those teachers, create systems around it. So you are, you've been in a, in a very much of a understandable part of it, which is actually it's like you know you're chasing a school system. Mm. The other bit is like it's really damn hard um, to do that well. If you look at, you know, what you inherit, uh, and again, this is referring now to the World Bank, uh, what they call uh, service delivery indicators, SDI, which measure the capabilities of teachers, their learning outcomes in eight countries in Africa. It's a bit old now, about six, seven years old now. Um, but if you look at the data, what it shows you is like in a country like Mozambique, the proportion of teachers that are sampled in the country that can pass, which means get 80% marks, on a fourth grade test is 0.3%. It's 2.4% in Nigeria. So, you know, if your your core element is your teachers need to teach kids, and they themselves can't have the level of competency required, it's very, very hard to make progress. Now, the next step of this, people will say, okay, fine, uh, therefore let's train the teachers, uh, which is obvious response to that problem. And yet you see that that investment that have been made in teacher training doesn't really easily convert to, to students' learning. Again, if you look at UIS data, look at Lesotho. I mean, I'm looking at the data that I have. There's an indicator of 4.C, 4.C, I think it is, uh, on the SDG that looks at the proportion of teachers that are trained in a particular country. Uh, in the case of Lesotho, it's 100%. And you look at the data on learning outcomes, 4.1.1A, it's 13%. So the conversion of, of training into learning is not very easy to do. And there's very good reasons for that. Just picture, for example, you're a teacher. You've been trained in some center somewhere, sent back to your classroom. You had the problem of your textbook dominating the how curriculum is transacted, which means that even if you've been trained on something new, you may not be able to do that. Because the expectation from the school, from the system, is to finish my curriculum for this year. If you add to that things like half my kids are not, not at grade level, and I'm supposed to be teaching kind of this one textbook to everybody, I've lost half my class by the time I start the day. If you add to that teacher motivation, teacher absenteeism, Again, the data from the bank's SDI data tells you that in those countries that are surveyed, teachers are absent from school once a week and from class two days a week. If you add to that student attendance, which can be also very low, you add to that, you know, some of the basic inputs that are not even there. So you end up with, you know, like a very suboptimal uh, statement of like insufficient everything to be able to produce learning. And then you're surprised uh, that it produces low learning. So in some countries that has made worse. 
because the same students are allowed to go uh, from year to year without any kind of like, you know, remediation. And the more you wait, the harder it becomes. So if I'm, I'm a fourth grade teacher teaching, I don't know, improper fractions and my kids don't understand numbers, it's a problem. But it's very hard for me then to kind of go back and be able to like focus my attention to the few kids, actually not the few kids, but the half the kid or two thirds of the kid who are falling behind. Which is why after all these years of schooling, you can go to school for six years, finish primary schooling, and you have 262 million people today out of 390 million, million kids who can't meet the minimum proficiency levels after six years of schooling. So I think it's a complex problem. It doesn't lend itself to easy solutions, which is why I think a lot of rigor needs to be brought to this question. It's not something you can just kind of like solve easily with facile prop uh, solutions like let's pay teachers more, let's train teachers more, let's uh, name it, name it, name it. You will have all kinds of uh, solutions being brought, but they're not sufficient to address the problem. Are there examples of countries that have successfully increased the literacy of their populations to the extent that you're sort of talking about? You know, what you have is some countries which perform very highly, but I have not seen a lot of countries kind of jump from one level to the other. Certainly not in low-income countries and even uh, a bit, perhaps a bit more in low, in low and middle-income countries. Um, I mean, the famous example is the Vietnam that your colleagues at UCL. So Vietnam is spectacular when it comes to PISA testing and so on. At what point did, did Vietnam grow? And this, was it always like this? Did it actually grow over time? Uh, is not something I don't know much about. What we tend to find in the data is that countries that do well have already done well in the past. Almost like a, a secular trend that remains quite static. But movements from A to B in a short period of time are very difficult to see. Mm. So in the same way people used to go to Finland to look at uh, models of schooling, there are now two uh, centers of pilgrimage, if you want, to look at uh, improvements in schooling. One is this tiny municipality of Sobral in, in Brazil, uh, which everybody looks at. Because again, pretty, I mean, it's very small, it's not a big, but still quite in interesting uh, as an experience. Where the, the top, the EDB, the National uh, Index in Brazil, gives you a sense of learning, and they're a very poor municipality. I refer, refer to that in my paper, there's actually quite a few blogs about this. So an example that's kind of endogenous, government-led, etc. The other ones tend to be much more driven by NGOs, um, heavily supporting governments. And there's a few of those. I mean, the, probably the more famous ones are the work that Pratham does in India uh, around being able to teach kids how to read. And they do that by ditching, if you want, the curriculum. They say, you know, forget the curriculum. It's not your, uh, where kids are. So there's no point in teaching them stuff they, they don't understand. So they came up with this whole teaching at the right level work, which has phenomenal success. The other one, which I'm also curious, curious about, is called Tusome in, in Kenya, which is at the level of the school system as a whole. So it's at boutiques, 33,000 schools. And there, with the support of RTI, the government of Kenya was able to increase uh, learning levels measurably at pretty significant scale. So it's feasible. And one of our research projects, actually, right now, it's called Learning at Scale. Uh, it's trying to kind of corral in, crowdsource all the projects that have achieved improvements in learning, improvements in reading at scale and been measured credibly. So you actually have a robust measurement behind it. It's still work in progress. It was about 10 products that have been identified that have demonstrably achieved kind of improvements in reading at scale. This said, you know, the question still remains for me, uh, not the Sobral example, the other ones, whether even those improvements in, in reading that you can see amount to a sufficient level in, in improvement to get you to grade level competency. Often they're not. Do you see big uh, effect sizes, 0.5 standard deviation and more sometimes, that may reflect an improvement of reading fluency from 15 words per minute to 20 words per minute, which is probably still kind of like one word every three seconds, which is very far from fluency and even further from comprehension. So it, we need to do a lot more work to understand what needs to be done to start tackle a problem that's very vexing and very difficult to do in low resource environments. It's not an easy problem to solve. Sometimes I think about um, historical examples of, you know, I know Libya increased its literacy rate very quickly. Even under Mao's People's Republic of China did so, or in Cuba, you know, there's, there, there are these examples. And I just wonder why they aren't looked at more closely today. I think, that, I think they should be looked at more closely. One of the interesting things that I think uh, struck me when I looked at early data on uh, reading outcomes and literacy mm -hmm. outcomes uh, by income groups, the, I think the World Bank's Development Report 2018 has a chart like this. What you see is that in each income group, the countries that do better than their peers, all were ex-Soviet bloc countries or communist countries. 
the examples you're giving, uh, Cuba and China also kind of like have the same feel to them. As well as Vietnam, as you mentioned earlier. Exactly. So what I think is happening is those school systems, and this is like broad conjecture on my part, nothing more, have an egalitarian ethos, which means to say that the school system as a whole believes and acts as if it believes that all children can and should learn as opposed to systems which are, in a sense, selective systems, which whose purpose is to say, my job, which is completely consistent with a very kind of ambitious curriculum, and the view is like, you know, kids need to go through this grind, the few who survive are the ones who work hard and done well, and we're gonna celebrate those kids. Uh, and those who have not done well, it's not my problem. You know, these are like the things that, uh, family circumstance, they didn't work well, blah, 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 what can I do about this? It's not my problem. But I think Kane and Louis Crouch did some work around this, uh, in the OECD countries, where you see that the countries that do better are the ones that, quote unquote, raise the floor, the ones that bring the kids from the one that's behind. So this idea of like, you know, it's not inconsistent with the idea of, of systems that are, that truly believe that, you know, an unfortunate term, but no child left behind is, is embedded in the ethos. And that translates into how teachers see the system, how principals act upon the system, how parents expect the system to behave. You know, I mean, I'm sure you've been school visits everywhere all over the world, and what you see in school systems that don't have this ethos is the opposite, which is uh, you go into a class, you ask the teacher, you know, I want to get, so, uh, have these kids read to me. And the teacher would be very quick to tell you, oh, these kids are dumb, these kids are smart. And in some way, having given up on those kids who were the label dumb quite fast, so there's no effort made to catch, catch them up to remedy that their work, which I think is, is the difference between systems that do well and don't do well at population level. Again, just give you this wild conjecture to be tested. I mean, it seems to me like some of what you're talking about is the systems that really have been built around this idea of meritocracy, where you put in the effort and you will succeed. And so those people who don't put in the effort, sort of it's their own failure. And then you're sort of describing systems that are more egalitarian. And it actually, it's sort of meritocracy doesn't actually enter the conversation, at least in the beginning years, right? And you want everyone to be able to read. And then from there, you can sort of justify inequality in different ways. Exactly right. And that's not the attitude I see in most systems that I've visited so far. I mean, it's interesting, you know, going back to this question of why is it hard to do uh, get reading right? If you did care about what you said, that all children should learn, now you are facing a class of 40 kids. You have one textbook, you have one teacher who's more or less trained. Even if you were motivated to try to address this problem of kids falling behind. And many teachers are, who are heroic and have visited them. You ask them, what do you do about those kids who are behind? And the answer often is, I do my best, I try to help them at lunchtime. But there's no system behind it. There's no system behind it. Which is why when you have like a good NGO like Pratham come in and do that for you, it shows you that those children can learn. But the school system itself, when she's struggling with pupil-teacher ratio, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, doesn't know how to address this problem systematically, right? So, uh, and it's very hard to do. There's a whole suite of work of options for doing that. But the question we're not asking right now is like, how do you do that kind of remediation, which is going to happen no matter what you have as school system, will be needed. What are my options in a low, low capability environment? Kind of going over to Finland for a second. You know, the reason why Finland. I mean, among many things, there's well, high capability teacher, etc. But also they have this, what they call the pit crew mentality, which is when kid is falling behind. Like a Formula One circuit, you don't wait for five rounds for, to catch them up. To identify the one which is like, you know, falling a bit behind and you help them catch up. That model may be feasible in a high uh, enriched environment. You have the teacher that you need. You have small classrooms. You have lots of resources to help. We can't do that in other systems. We don't have the capabilities of, you know, Central African Republic has 96 kids per class, per student, per teacher rather. So it's very hard to do this kind of model there. And yet it's going to be needed because there too you will have kids who are falling behind. So how do you solve this problem? So I think a lot of work needs to be going into that kind of research to know what is feasible in a capability environment to kind of catch kids up and keep them up when they fall behind. So I want to turn to the global education architecture, which you focus on specifically in your article. And I guess the question is about, you know, to what extent is that architecture, the the sort of international community, so to speak, to blame for, you know, this, in a sense, learning failure worldwide, so many children not reaching this foundational literacy and numeracy? I mean, so the blame, I think, is shared, right? Because uh, on the one hand, you could say, you know, donors, no matter what we say about it, are marginal. I mean, certainly LMICs and above, donor contribution to those economies, to those education budgets is very marginal. It's about 2%. For low-income countries, donors are a big part of, the, of that uh, uh, financing. 
So I would say they do pay a share of responsibility of what they're doing there. Are they doing the best possible work? Are they pulling in the same direction? Are they? So I would say at, at a minimum, we should interrogate what the donor community is doing and whether it's doing its best, most focused, most rigorous work, pulling in the same direction, or is it not? And uh, I would say today, it's hard to make the case that they are pulling in the same direction and are doing the most rigorous work, I think. So what are some of the reasons behind this sort of collective failure, I think is the word you used in the article, of the international community? So, you know, what, what, what can we point to as the reason that we, we haven't been able to support countries or even school systems achieve literacy, even if it's only, you know, partly to blame at that international donor level? Um, I think a few things. So if you look back at the MDG era, which was, uh, there was one education goal. It was universal primary completion. Now we have 10 indicators, 43 targets, one other two. Yeah, 163 indicators or something like this. Correct. So I think the success of the MDG, because I think it drove certain results, drove people to say, okay, we want a piece of that too. We want also our own agenda to be reflected there. And because it's supposed to be a global agenda, we're trying to kind of like put in there that what you know Australia needs and Armenia needs and what Korea needs and what Malawi needs in the same in the same bucket. So what you have right now is basically a small gas board of everything you can possibly want. And instead of saying, okay, fine, this country is at this maturity level, we need to focus on X. We pretend as if the problem today for Malawi is the same as it is for Korea, which is global citizenship. You know, what does it mean? This is school system. So I think in some ways that that kind of like ability to now focus on everything and have the legitimacy of the SDG behind it makes it uh, more difficult for people to agree what is more fundamental than, uh, than other things. And governments as well, I think, are very prone to say, what do I do in education? And, you know, maybe more, more keen to address issues they feel are more important, like university education, lifelong learning, or face a cohort of kids who have gone to school, finished university, and don't have jobs, or have a growing middle class that is clamoring for free secondary schooling. So in that environment, it's very, very hard for governments to maintain the focus on the building blocks of education, which is, you cannot leapfrog, which is basic education. If so you're building this kind of like structures over a very, very weak foundation, and what you need to do in that case is down the line, you begin to make up later on in the school system for what it, it lacked earlier in the school system. So countries are not very focused on, on that. And I think uh, donors, because you have to meet uh, the country needs or the country dialogue, feel often the, the reluctance to kind of like, you know, press the point about foundational learning as a key element. Uh, but uh, the result today is that what you have is an infinity, infinite number of indicators and all of them are underpowered. The work behind them is underpowered to the point, and maybe people can accuse me of literalness, but when I think about, about the SDGs and being influenced by the work we do in our health sector, you don't treat those indicators as aspirational. When we talk about eradicating polio, we don't mean that as a, like, oh, it'd be nice to do. We don't say, oh, let's put a little bit of money here and maybe God knows if we're going to have some effect or not. You just go after it with everything you have in terms of ingenuity, innovation, advoc, everything you want, right? So uh, if you're treating SDG4 not as some dream, but as some objective that you're trying to pursue, it's very hard to how we can have meet those objectives, all of them in all the countries with the money that we have. And that, for me, leads me to the question of like focus, prioritization. In the paper, I try to explain why it's very, it's very hard for the existing actors to actually play that role of prioritization in this context of SDGs, which are all encompassing. Mm, yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of competition among this such a diverse range of actors that have their own agendas, their own histories, their own sort of commitments potentially to the taxpayer in whatever country that's funding them, or maybe donors that are don't you know giving money. Yeah, I can see how it's a real smorgasbord, I think is the word you used earlier. I mean, it would be so hard to sort of herd all of these different organizations in the same same direction. And then when you have an, a global agenda that is so diverse and, you know, is sort of a grab bag of everything you can imagine put into one, it just becomes a sort of a recipe for nothing to get done or very little to get done or to have the political will to move sort of in a common direction. So I guess, you know, what you're saying is you're calling for a narrowing of the focus, at least for this moment. We should focus in on something that is sort of essential to future learning, um, essential for participating in society, and essential to get all of these diverse people's minds and institutions' minds on sort of a single 
goal. The, it, from my understanding, that is sort of what you're calling for. Yeah, I mean, that ideally would be the case, right? Like, because I think we should agree that this is a, no progress in the countries without it. I mean, they're, they're, they're just like, I don't see how, you don't get to go to secondary school, you fail primary school. And okay, so, uh, so many of the aspirations we have the SDG are, are built upon the premise of a good basic education. Mm. So that would be, I think, needed. I understand as well from what you you just described. It's like everybody uh, has their own incentives, their own agenda, and those are very powerful. You know, we've seen it in health as well. Like uh, even when you try so hard to get people to coalesce around certain goals, it's very hard to do so because you're, you're within agency. Incentives trumps any kind of between agency kind of incentives. So the way I kind of like more modestly uh, try to tackle that is to say, fine, people can do whatever they want, but those who agree upon this idea that foundational literacy and literacy is capital, and there's a few agencies and a few countries that believe that, at least let's work with those, uh, you know, as in, a, in a compact with those. And then, uh, so which means that holding ourselves accountable, which means like tracking progress over time, you know, deluding ourselves, not talking up, learning outcomes that they don't exist, and kind of be, I mean, it's gonna be really hard work to even get that done in those few countries. And a part of me also wants to kind of like get to your earlier question, which is there's so few case studies of success at country level that it makes it very hard for donors to say, hey, I'm going to put more money behind this because it's working. I think we need to show some success and create a more positive view about like what education investment is like for donors, without which it's kind of always going to end up being a case of uh, it's important for you to do because education is important, but don't ask us too much, too many questions about results, you know? Which I think is not, is handicapping mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. the energy of donors to say um, let's put money in education because it doesn't convert to results quite as easily. So if you could show some success in the next three, four, five years, that would be great. Um, you know, thinking about trying to find successful countries and the ones that we sort of mentioned earlier begs the question if some of the sort of big actors in the global architecture in education right now, the World Bank, OECD, UNESCO, et cetera, and some of the big NGOs, if there's sort of an ideological difference at play that's sort of preventing, you know, being able to learn from a socialist country inside, say, the World Bank seems like a big gap to bridge. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, they were the ones who kind of like brought to my attention the fact that those countries were doing better. Or the former. But I think it's a, it's a different kind of scholarship you need. A more historical view upon like, I'm more interested today in like Korea in the 50s and 60s than I'm into Korea today. Or Vietnam in the 70s and 80s and Vietnam today, because that's where the path mm. that they grew. Mm. Whereas, whereas now you're looking at a fully formed baby, a fully formed like a system that's performing highly, but it's very hard to know what they did to go to become high performing. Mm. I think those kinds of scholarship on the history of the education system is frankly lacking. I haven't seen it myself. Maybe I didn't miss out on, on the literature on this one. I agree. I think it's very minimal. And, and I, I think it's, I agree with you. I think it is absolutely needed. And there's so much to learn particularly because you know the this development agenda there's been so much work from the 1950s really um and we need to sort of dig through that history and learn from it for you know for today i i absolutely agree with you so in your paper you do this really wonderful thing where you sort of look through these different players and you sort of make recommendations on on you know potentially what they could do and and i'll recommend to the listener to go and actually read that because i think there's some really powerful statements that you make and, you know, you do it in the sort of spirit of learning, right? It's we're working together. We want to learn from our failures in a sense. I mean, you're, you're sort of bringing up this idea of there, there's a lot to learn from when we fail and, and not to be ashamed of, of failure and use it, and which is a really nice pedagogical tool that we use with students all the time. So it's nice to think about that in terms of institutions. And so I, I want to end the conversation today by asking about the institution where you've spent a long time, the Gates Foundation. And, you know, what sort of learning could you do from Gates's work over the last few decades? And in particular, some of the failures that it's had in education, what could it learn to better achieve this sort of goal of trying to focus attention on foundational numeracy and literacy? Uh, it's a fair question. And uh, one thing I really enjoy about being at the foundation is exactly that, which is there is a strategic focus, you know, whatever you might want to choose, whether it's building a new vaccine for malaria or eradicating polio or getting education right. There's enormous amount of examination on a continuous basis, an annual review of progress and an invitation in those kind of can be pretty brutal reviews of what has worked and not worked and what you're going to do differently. 
a certain spirit I think is needed here, which is to say, you know, obviously we're going to get it right. As I said, very difficult problems. I'm not underestimating the difficulty of the problems. But if we're not stopping and say, are we actually making progress? We're not saying, you know, what are we doing right, wrong? What can we do more of, less of collectively? I don't know what we do. Uh, so it's for me like fundamental to the everything you do. If you had the recipe that we can just import and plunk into every country, we do it. But education is political, it's path dependent, it's like li linked by from so many different conditions. So I think the only only difference between kind of like uh, what keeps us from fooling ourselves or being ideological about things is data and like the ability to track over time whether or not whatever it is that our conjecture might be is actually materializing. In our own work internally, we have complete changes of approaches every three, two, three years in every, every one of our program areas because you realize what you're doing is not working and you stop doing it. And for me, that idea of like, you know, adapting, iterating, correcting is, is key. You can't have a 10 year plan that you just implement blindly. But what I see today is a lack of attention to are we making progress and see that conversation as being a needed one, not one that causes us to be defensive. It should cause us to be kind of reflective about wh why it's happening, not happening. But if we see data and lack of progress as reflecting upon our own bad work, I guess then what we do is sugar sugarcoat the data, we don't look at it, we ignore it, etc. So for me, the idea of having some accountability uh, globally which basically means shedding light and having honest conversations about progress and lack of progress is capital for progress. Uh, I don't see how we can how we can make any progress without having these kind of hard conversations collectively. Uh, and my invitation is that is to have uh, exactly that. So I've been looking for the forum that is willing to have that. It doesn't exist today. Hoping that somebody picks up on that idea and uh, does something with it. But I have it's above my pay grade, so I don't know what's going to happen. I think that's a really nice invitation for maybe someone who's listening to to pick this up and create an international forum to talk about progress and lack of progress and learning from the hard data that we might not want to actually look at. Giran Bahari, thank you so much for joining Fresh Ed. It was a real pleasure to talk today. Thanks so much, Will. It was fun. Giran Bahari is a senior advisor on global education at the Gates Foundation. His latest article is entitled, The Pathway to Progress on SDG 4 Requires the Global Education Architecture to Focus on Foundational Learning and to Hold Ourselves Accountable for Achieving It. A transcript of today's interview can be found at freshedpodcast.com. Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not Fresh Ed, which takes no institutional position. If you've liked what you've heard today, please rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews really do help. Fresh Ed's team includes Sherry Yang, Lushi Kwaba, Fatih Akhtas, Ing Jung Cho, Obafemi Ongunle, Diang Jian, Joe Fei, Annabella Boteng, Anya Lin, and Phyllis Manash. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Primate. Fresh Ed is an independently run podcast without advertisements and is made possible by the support of the Open Society Foundations, NORAG, and listeners like you. Please consider donating to Fresh Ed by visiting freshedpodcast.com donate. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll be back next week.